I went exploring with a bunch of friends at the Trans Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. Portions of this place are underground. The buildings were left with hospital equipment, beds, books, patient files, literally everything. It's eerie as if a zombie apocalypse occurred and everyone left. It operated from 1864 to 1994. The facility was self-sustaining, i.e. the patients farmed the land and had all resources on campus. The years this was open, a lot of horror stories came out this place. This wasn't the modern day psychiatric ward, more like a prison where families paid a lot of money to hide their mentally ill, or the state put undesirables. Now, there's an underground network, but was heavily blocked off with chains. However, the main buildings were easily accessible, but the access ways to the underground were blocked off inside as well. Every time we got near one of the underground tunnel systems, we could hear faint music playing. It sounded like a music box. We found a bent wired gate and attempted to file in. The music got louder and we were all pretty freaked out. We were all promptly arrested before going into the tunnels. There's a lot of speculation about the tunnel still to this day. The new owner said he was afraid of asbestos and was fearing for our safety. He was very grim and agreed to drop charges if we never went back. We obliged happily. Still, I sometimes think of my interactions there, all of the remnants left behind and get severely creeped out. This is a true story my grandma experienced. Truth be told, during her life before she and my mum moved out of their home village, she experienced quite a few strange things. And this is one of them. Before I go deeper into this story, I need to let you know that my grandmother lived in a small village and was working as a postwoman. Her job allowed her to talk and meet with old people at the time who told us some spooky, supposedly true stories about the area or people living there. Being a postwoman also meant that she had to travel quite a bit to deliver mail, as there were fields, forests, and some people lived further from the center of the village. During spring, summer, and autumn, when the roads were good, she used her bike and when it was winter or very muddy, she took her horse with a wagon. This happened in the winter or late autumn because she took her horse. As I mentioned, some people lived quite further, so she had to cross a forest in order to deliver some mail. As she was going back, she took another route in that forest and somehow she ended up going in circles. She recalled that old folks told her a story that once there was a mansion and it sank into the ground instantly during a wedding feast and only a priest managed to escape. Everyone else went into the ground with the house. Supposedly years passed and the forest took over the place, but somehow it remained sinister. My grandma figured that it must be the same cursed place she heard that whoever walks into its territory ends up going in circles. She spent a good half of the day trying to get out of it, but no matter where she turned, she ended up going in circles. Round and round she went, not being able to escape. Then as she got tired, she gave up and spoke to her horse. She asked him to take her home and release the reins, thus giving her horse total control and freedom. The horse took them home. Turns out she'd spent a good five to eight hours because it was already night when she returned. To this day, she can't explain what happened. That accident occurred after years of work and she was born in that village. So she knew the place pretty well. My friends and I discovered the opening to a tunnel to the sewer system this one summer in middle school. And me and my friends started to go there to smoke and relax away from the public. 
There was this one spot that we liked that was dry and full of graffiti. So that was our spot. But it was pretty deep in there. One day we noticed the messages on the wall. And we knew it was fresh since we'd never seen it before. We went back again and again without any further incident. One day, me and the other two decided to skip school and go in there to chill. We were there for about half an hour. And we had just finished smoking a blunt when we started hearing a faint voice burst into laughter, followed by other voices bursting into laughter. We couldn't tell if it was coming from the entrance, or the deeper part of the tunnel. We stayed quiet, and started hearing the laughter, getting louder, and more intense. One of my friends quickly went up to the nearest manhole cover and started pushing up. My other friend went over to help, and they were able to open it. We crawled out of there onto a busy road, and ran for our lives to the nearest apartment complex. We never went back after that. My family has owned property on the edge of the southeastern part of the Tamarack Wildlife Refuge, dating back to at least when my great great grandparents were around. The property itself is absolutely massive, with three fields, a lake, and a forest all around it. In my opinion, it's a very unnerving place, if you aren't able to force yourself to keep calm. Almost everyone who has lived out there swears they've seen something or another happen to them at some point. Between 2001 to 2004, somewhere between late spring slash early summer, when I was between six to eight, my dad and I had stayed at one of my cousin's homes, out there for the night. My cousin had gotten up early to go fishing and my dad had went to town for breakfast. He had asked if I wanted to go but I said no, as I wanted to play video games. After what felt like forever, I was starting to get anxious and began wondering where everyone was, as there were six different houses out there at the time and I hadn't seen anyone walk up or down the driveway all day. So I walk over to the kitchen window, and look outside and notice what seems to be a rather large, very pale boulder. I had to do a double take, and thought to myself that I hadn't ever noticed a boulder there before. The more I looked at it, the more unnatural it seemed. It looked like some humanoid hunched over on its legs with its arms bent over its knees, kind of looking like T-Rex arms, but that's the only thing I can think of that it was similar to. I couldn't really see its face that well, but from what I saw, it appeared to be blurred. This thing could have easily been at least six feet tall if it stood up. Now I was easily frightened as a child, but I had never felt terror like this before. I was overcome with dread and began to silently cry instantly. I crouched down under the windowsill, pressing myself as far against the wall as I could, scared out my mind, hoping my dad or cousin would come back. After what felt like forever, I heard a car driving up the driveway and looked. My dad had returned. I bolted outside nearly in hysterics, telling him what I had seen. I pointed to where it was but nothing was there. One of my cousins, different from the previously mentioned one, lived further down the driveway, was walking with her boyfriend while it was dark. She had decided to play a prank on him as he was easily startled, and ran further down the driveway into the woods to jump out at him. She sees him turn on his flashlight in the distance, and he starts to call her name out. She gets a little closer to observe him, and sees him start to walk into another part of the woods. What the hell are you doing? She asks. He turns around and was terrified and told her they need to leave now. She wanted to go see what he saw, but he insisted they go back to her house. Once there, he told her that he saw a pale creature with her face beckoning him into the woods. Present day. Earlier this week, the cousin I had mentioned in the previous paragraph went out to the driveway. She had moved in the two year gap with someone who was more sensitive to feeling an area, if that makes any sense. But they went out there and drove up and down the driveway, stopping at various spots, never getting out the car. 
they had stopped outside the house, and her and her friend began tensing up. Without prior knowledge of what I had seen before, she began to describe the same creature to my cousin. Naturally, they got the hell out of there for the night. They went back a day or so later, and it was just tense out there. They parked in front of my cousin's old house, and that's when it hit the fan. There was nothing but a feeling of malice coming from the woods to the left of them, and they both saw something big next to the car peering in. They don't know if they just psyched themselves out or what, but they left again. My cousin then told me about their experience and me being driven to figure out what the hell this thing is that we've seen, asked to go back out there with them. So last night, my younger sister and I met up with them and we all drove out there. My cousin and sister were kind of tense and apprehensive about going out there as my sister has never felt comfortable there at all. We had the heat on in the car as the girls were all cold while I was roasting. We get out there and my cousin's friend and my sister both said that it felt very calm and still. We drove up to the top of the driveway and parked for a moment and decided to head down to the main field in between where I saw the thing and where my cousin's boyfriend saw it. We parked there and after a moment, everything got incredibly tense. The friend and my sister were both staring towards the house where my experience was, while my cousin and I were both staring straight ahead at the driveway. As we both thought we saw something slightly move. We sat there for a good 15 minutes before all of a sudden deciding that we need to leave that instant. I was very calm the whole trip, but after we left the field, I was suddenly freezing. The friend was kind of freaking out about something watching us and following us to the forest on the side. Once we got back on the main road, I felt a little sick, but only briefly. Then I wasn't freezing any longer. We have no plans to return to the property after dusk, at least not to investigate what exactly happened. But the events have us all confused. Any insight would be greatly appreciated. Next story by Adam Milanovic. I used to do a lot of exploring in my younger days, mainly when my friends and I would skip school and decide our time was better spent finding new places to explore than actually learning in a structured environment. I'm Australian, and one of our favourite places to explore was a place called White Bay Power Station, which was a coal powered station that closed its doors on Christmas Day, 1983. We were exploring between 97 and 2000, so the decay had well and truly set in by this time. On a side note, films such as The Matrix Reloaded and Mission Impossible had parts filmed here. Anyway, this place was absolutely huge. It had all of the usual abandoned adornments, such as graffiti and satanic signs and messages scrawled over the walls. There was also a time we went and found a freshly dead pigeon, which had a noose around its neck. It was multi-leveled. The exact number of levels were too hard to determine because it would all depend on which flight of stairs you took which part of the power station you entered from, and which actual part of the power station you were in. On some flights of stairs, you could be eight floors up and be able to see through the metal staircase you were standing on due to it decaying from rust. The most dangerous thing about this place was the way some levels would just drop off. There would be a big concrete platform, then nothing, no railing or anything to stop you falling off. There was also a door which we opened that took us to the roof. A roof I nearly fell off of because I got dizzy from the sheer height of it. Though the scariest part of the whole power plant were the big chutes that they used to store the coal in. This is hard to explain, but I'll try my best. Imagine having two thin metal catwalks on either side of the huge metallic voids. You couldn't see more than four feet in front of you on the catwalks because of the sheer darkness and on the inside of the voids that the coals were stored in. 
You couldn't see more than four feet in front of you on the catwalks because of the sheer darkness and the inside of the voids that the coal was stored in were the blackest darkness you can imagine. So basically standing on these catwalks were much like walking the plank, except you can't see anything in front of you. And if the floor below you gave way, you were done for. We also used to frequent old train tunnels in Sydney. It was quite startling to be walking through a pitch black tunnel, came around the bend to see the light from the other side, with the figure of a person walking towards you. This used to happen often, as the homeless and drug users would take refuge in the tunnels to either get out of the elements or to get high. Funnily enough, some of the best tunnels were put back in use for the 2000 Sydney Olympics, like tram services, and now they're all cleaned up and well lit. Another type of place we used to explore a lot were underground canals and drainage tunnels. We got so good at mapping them out that we knew which tunnels to take to get us as close as possible to the fast food outlets for lunch. We found one weird tunnel one day. We were walking along and noticed an offshoot, which made us drop to our knees and crawl. At the end of this tunnel, there was what I could only describe as a small water reservoir. The water in it was only about an inch lower than the pipe we were in and had a newish looking ladder about five foot away on the left side of the pipe we were currently crouched in and in a metal grate above it. We had to maneuver ourselves on an angle right to lip the pipe and jump to grab the ladder and climb out the gate. We found out pretty quickly that the whole thing looked so new because we were now standing in someone's backyard. Ontario, Canada, a suburban city park. I was 14 at the time. It was night and I was taking a shortcut through the lake trail with very little non-existent light posts. All of a sudden, out of the corner of my eye, I spot a bright, glowing, solid luminescent white figure, not an orb. It was in the dense brush and dense trees of the forest, about eight feet away on the left of the path. I kept walking, and it seemed to move in the same direction as me. It looked like a figure, since the leaves and branches outlined it at certain dimensions although not clearly enough of a humanoid shape. I was a curious kid and did not frighten easily, but what freaked me out initially was how soundless the figure was moving through the bush. I think I probably let out a shriek and backed away in fear when I fully comprehended the situation. The figure was gone as soon as I looked back in that direction, and to this day, I find myself wondering if it was a mental distortion, although I wasn't on any drugs or anything like that, or had never experienced any type of hallucinations. If it was a very silent human being wearing white, glowing clothing, which is very unlikely, it somehow managed to give off no sounds at all. If it was a very silent human being wearing white, glowing clothing, that managed to give off no sounds, that be of branch or leaf or anything in between. Was it a ghost or some other entity? These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors, so he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip. Just the two of us. For those of you who aren't familiar, the Grand Tentons are well known for their wildlife, specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up until that point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car and seeing Grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt, large knives attached to each side of his pack, 
bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country you're supposed to make noise is to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on them. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound backpack makes it difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent save for the rushing stream that was to the left of our trail. Silent woods are never a good sign as this usually indicates a predator nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend, and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the time, and gave each other glances of knowing. I came over the top of the hill, and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet, as he was behind me. So I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and started flinging it wildly behind me, trying to get his attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting on all fours, not looking away from us once. My husband quickly swung me around so that I was behind him and started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly towards us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. The bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, as he bolted towards the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My husband said, it's probably just some falling branches. We both knew this wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up. And at the same moment, my husband stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me, and I turned to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we were standing was a large, dark mass, black, brownish. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just moments before. Its back was facing us, and then it stood on its back legs. It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My husband was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're gonna be okay. I'm sure this won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and eat a snack. About a minute after we'd sat down, I noticed bushes moving in line towards the clearing towards us. Out of the bushes comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did. But he came straight for us. My husband being this crazy nut decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think of was just my luck. But that wasn't even close to what happened on the second night. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and routes we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you to make sure everything is okay. There were not many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently over the three days we were on these trails, we had been the sole hikers, and we didn't see another person once we were en route. Anyhow, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We'd been following hoofprints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. 
I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my bootlace and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and my husband was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine for some reason wouldn't even turn on. We needed to find somewhere to set camp up, and we needed to eat. It was freezing and the wind was blowing, creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear my husband or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked out he was until we'd left. There was no moonlight, so all the illumination we had was from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sound. He also thought it would ward off any nearby predators. This is where we knew our anxiousness wasn't paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. It was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds echoing from beyond the tree line. Were they falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. There was a thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, definitely not a falling tree. There was another thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. His hands found mine, and we clung to each other paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. Shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped, and then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inwards. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside. So I flashed my flashlight at that side of the tent, what I saw made my blood run cold. It was in the shape of a human face, pressed into the tent wall. I could make out the nose and open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. My husband said, screw that, pulled out a Glock from his sleeping bag, cocked it, and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back and we heard fast footsteps heading towards the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent until the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals we had left in the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. We think it was mud anyway. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. I used to live on a military base in Hawaii, and there wasn't much to do there. I don't know how old I was at the time, 
but maybe around kindergarten. Hawaii didn't require kindergarten at the time, so I wasn't in school yet, I know that at least. Outside our house, there was a covered car park that people in the community used because the houses didn't have garages, and there were various storm drains that were around the car park. I would always play there since it was right outside our house. I wasn't the brightest, but kids can be dim, right? So one day I was playing there, and I thought it would be fun to drop a thing down the storm drain to see how far it went. I had dropped a few rocks and some small sticks and eventually ran out of things to throw in. So I started saying hello to hear my echo. I didn't expect to hear anything other than my own voice. I was surprised when I got a response. A little girl called back to me. I wasn't scared, just confused. I asked her what she was doing down there, and she said that her and her family lived there. I remembered that I kept trying to look closer, but it was so dark you couldn't see the bottom at all. We sat for a while and spoke. I don't remember the whole conversation, but it went on for a while. I vividly remember the last part of it though, because I felt so guilty and hurt. Years later, I still do, even though I'm not entirely sure it happened. She wanted to play with me, and I said I could invite her in for dinner, and she got really excited by that idea. So I ran inside and asked my mum if my friend could come over for dinner. She said no, and she wouldn't let me go back out to tell her. The next day I went out to explain to my friend what had happened, but she wasn't there. I never heard from the little girl in the drain again. I remember crying that day. I blamed my mum for me losing the only friend I had made there. My mum still remembers this thing happening, and just how upset I was because of it. When I was growing up, there had been a few forests around town that had famous stories linked to them. The people believed that the forests were cursed from the Native American tribes who were relocated from their homes way back when. They said the forests belonged to them, and when you go in and past your gut feeling, those people pass away in those woods. When my dad and sister and I moved when I was around 13 or so, we moved to a small town. Across the street was a hill, and at the top stood a blue water tower. I used to hang out in the woods across the street from my house. It was quiet, and the birds always chirped. Other kids were scared of the woods, but I went up there to draw and listen to the birds. Also, because it was at the top of a hill, I could look out and see the entire town and felt the breeze, but when the animals went quiet, it was time to go. When the school year started, I found out this was an ancient Indian burial ground. Every year our class would go up to the hill and learn about it, and the town and the school were actually very respectful of the forest and the hill. We took care of the trees there, if you looked at the ground, you could still see a lot of Native American arrowheads. We never took them home. We knew we weren't supposed to. I didn't at least. I actually would go into the forest when I was walking home because the bullies were too scared to go in. I felt safe there, but I also had to remember to respect it. In the forest, we also had wood piles. When we would go into the forest, we would make piles for the local foxes to nest in the wintertime. One time, I went to school after retreating into the forest from one of my bullies. A couple of my classmates came up to me, and one of them said, What did you do to Jacob? I looked at the kid and said, Nothing, why? They looked at each other and said, Well, something scared him, and we thought you scared him in the woods. I didn't scare him, I reply. I just want to hang out up here, that's all. That time, Jacob threw a rock at me, and I remember. It landed to my right, and I hurried up my pace in the woods, and 
thought he left the woods at that point like he always did. He screamed raccoon at me when I reached the top of the hill. I cried and went home. Because for some reason, that time the bullying hurt. Whatever happened to Jacob in the woods, I'll never know. He stopped bullying me from that day on and said sorry to me and that it will never happen again. He did say something happened in the woods, but will never say by what or who. But he had a look of terror and practically begged me to take the apology. I told him it was okay and went on my way. He could never look me in the eye again. That was back in middle school. So when I went to college, I saw him at the 4th of July college event. I was going to catch up with him about life and put the bullying behind us. He glanced, but still looked uneasy. So I simply walked by. Sometimes my sister would walk home with me after school. Only once or twice I recall. Every time that we entered the woods, she felt lost. I even had her lead us and she couldn't follow the trails. It was like she kept seeing these invisible trails that went in circles. She started to breathe heavy and cry and said we were lost and she had an anxiety attack and just told me she had to get out of the woods. I was totally chill and knew the forest pretty well, then led us out and it was easy. It was literally just three trails, one from the south, one from the north and one going up the hill to our house. You could get in and out in the forest in under 10 minutes from one side to the other. One of my favorite hobbies used to be exploring old and abandoned mines, mostly for the hell of it. But occasionally you would find some sort of mineral debris that you could bring back home as a trophy. I went with friends and I went alone. It was an obsession for a long time. That is until the following event. I always used to dedicate my Saturday afternoons to exploring abandoned mines once I knew where they were. There used to be a website that I was fairly active in where people would share where they had found abandoned mines and potential routes for trying to explore them. I always had a lot of fun and rarely ever bumped into anyone doing the same thing I was when I was doing it. We'd built up quite a little fun online community. And one day, I'm challenged by someone I knew online to check out this particular cave. It was a cave slash abandoned mine. It seemed to be quite old dating back to the mid 1800s. They were of course searching for some mineral and I don't know whether they found it or not. Point being that it was apparently scary, but structurally rather safe. So after doing a little bit more research, I waited for the opportune moment, i.e. a Saturday afternoon, and went on my merry way. When I reached the structure itself, which was very remote and took over a two hour drive to arrive to, I was pleasantly surprised. It was indeed very well preserved and I could park my vehicle there with ease, which is something that you'll find is often more challenging than you may expect. I donned my usual gear and stepped inside. With my flashlight on, I started looking around, taking in the scene, the sight, the smells, and having my camera at the ready. I made sure from my own point of view that it was structurally safe and started making my way in. This was always the best part, leaving the light behind and entering a world of darkness. It was like being swallowed whole. After a few footsteps, it became eerily dark and the smell of damp permeated my nostrils. I loved exploring. Clearly, I wasn't the first person to be here. Countless graffitis and carve masters had been here and etched their names and logos onto every corner of the wall. This is common while exploring. You'll find this early on, but when you get to the true darkness, it's when people tend to shy away. The further in you go, the less artwork you see. 
I carried on going in, taking in all of my surroundings. I reached a part that my friend had told me about. It was a very narrow tunnel. It was almost like one of those moving walls you see in Laura Croft, or perhaps a better way to describe it, trying to move through two slices of almost touching bread. I don't know why they designed the tunnel this way. Surely they had a good reason. Perhaps there were some objects that they simply couldn't pass. So I shimmied my way across, flashlight at the ready, and carried on into the darkness. There were many twists and turns, and all of it fun. I also need to point out that I use a red chalk in order to mark my way. This way I never forget where I've been and can always make my way back by following the red chalk. It also helps that I draw arrows along with my lines. As I'm going along, I hear something in the distance, what sounds like water, which isn't an uncommon thing. But the sound of water is something else, as it means there's a drip, which can mean structural instability in some places. Curiosity got the better of me though. This was certainly an interesting cave, lots of debris, and lots of interesting stuff being left behind. I'd found an old mining helmet, funnily enough. I didn't dare take it though, I like to leave history where it remains, but carried on on my exploration. By this point, I was fairly certain that I was one of the few people who'd ever ventured this far in quite a long time. Just as I was walking though, do I hear something behind me? What sounds like footsteps? I stop in my tracks and turn around. There's no one. I'm starting to feel quite hot. The room is getting significantly smaller. And I know from my friend's description that this means I'm going to be entering a much larger cavern very soon. Excitement is building. And just as I get towards the end, it narrows even further. There's a brief slit in the rock, just enough for a man to pass that clearly has been worked on by many men as a hole to climb through. So I look out. Looking down, I see that there's a drop. A significant one, and realize this is where I'll need my rope. Fortunately for me, I think I can make the jump, and with the rope secured, make my way down. This place was volatile as hell. There were a few holes in the middle. I think maybe that the ground gave way there, and that's when I realized it probably wasn't the best idea to be in this place but my friend assured me that around the edges, I'd be fine. I only wanted to take a few pictures and make the most of my time here before I went back. Just as a, see, I managed to do it kind of thing. That's when I heard it. The voice of my grandfather speaking. Only two words. Get out. They echoed through the cave and I turned around to where the sound had originated from, to illuminate nothing, and no one. The thing is, my grandfather has been dead for 20 years. This severely creeped me out. I decided to put one foot back on the rock, and make my way with the rope back up to the small passage. I looked out again, after I'd got my picture, and wondered what that was all about, and told myself that it had all been in my head. I started to make my way out, thoroughly spooked, when I heard it. A loud bang, and a sharp grinding sound. It was unmistakable. The hole that I had seen previously had gotten bigger, and consumed some of the land from the top. Is it possible? that the voice of my dead grandfather saved me? Had he kept me from falling and perishing in the abyss? Because it was my intention to stay there a while longer. If I had done so, could it have been the end of me? That seriously changed my outlook on what I was doing, and started choosing my caves more carefully the next time. And after a few more attempts, I stopped going altogether. 
I realized just how dangerous it was, and elected to do something a little less life-threatening. Grandpa, if you're out there, thank you. This happened two years ago in June, in Poland, where me and my brother live. I got a call from my aunt if I could go and meet her where she works. I agreed, and after 30 minutes went to see her. She asked me if I could look at the place where she worked because she needed to leave and see her boyfriend, Daniel. I asked why, and she explained that just before she called me, Daniel had called her. He and two of his friends, Francis and John, were at a road trip not too far from where we live. They decided that they wanted to do a short trip and shoot some wind cheetah guns for fun. They decided to drive to a point on the hill where a small old bunker is. The bunker is so small that only two people can enter, and it's only one room with windows fronting every direction. It's there because of the World War, and we live on the border of Germany. My aunt said that for now that's all she knows, and she needs to go to them, because somehow they can't leave, and that they were scared to their cause. I stayed at her place of work, which is a cigarette shop, and waited for her to return. They got back 10 minutes later, and as I said before, they were closer to our location. When they left the car, my aunt's boyfriend sat in the front of the shop with his friends, and they were pale from fear. And when I say pale, I mean their faces were basically white, and they weren't saying a word. I waited patiently for them to tell me what had happened. When they arrived at the spot, nothing was wrong. They went out of the car and started to prepare the air guns. They went onto the roof of the bunker, which was around one and a half meters high and started to shoot for fun. They were shooting the rocks, not people, because there was no one around. And as they'd finished, they started going down from the bunker. And it was in that moment that they noticed something very strange. Their car, was standing there in plain sight around 10 meters from where they were shooting from. At first glance, nothing had changed. But then one of them noticed that there were bricks piled up from the ground up to the chassis of the car around every single wheel. It was like they had drove straight into the middle of some kind of wall. But let's not forget that it was an area close to an old bunker with an old dirt road. And there was 0% of possibility that they had not noticed it after leaving the car. All three of them had ran straight into the car and locked themselves in. Daniel was the one who was driving that day, and he started the car normally, but the vehicle just wouldn't move. Like these little walls around the wheel were strong enough to prevent them from driving away. They all started panicking at that point. John ran out the car and started kicking the bricks to set the car free. At some point he was certain that it was enough and that the walls were destroyed to the point that maybe they could leave now. He entered the car. Daniel tried again, but now the car wouldn't even start. The third guy called a friend from a city near to their location and asked if they could tow their car. He agreed, but after 10 to 15 minutes called them back. He was standing on the road down the hill and was seeing them. He called to ask for directions because somehow he couldn't find the way that led up to the hill. At some point, he started screaming that something out in the woods was near them and was running straight for the car. Francis said that the guy was screaming like he was scared for his life. The only problem was that they were not seeing anything running at them. Nothing had left the woods, which they were all seeing from close up. At this point, they were all screaming and it was very hectic. The funny thing is that the guy who was supposed to be helping them just hung up and left them there. After a few minutes of straight up panic, they managed to stay quiet for a moment, just to try and hear if anything is walking nearby. And after a few seconds of silence, something knocked on the window of the car. The knock sounded like it was made by something metallic and large. It was the window on the right side of the car facing the forest. It was at that point Daniel called my aunt 
and then she called me and went to get them. Daniel was really scared while telling us what had happened, but it wasn't the strangest thing. The weirdest thing is that his two buddies were silent and hadn't spoken a word since they'd arrived at my aunt's job. She told me a few weeks later that they were pretty strange after the incident. No one is talking about that day anymore. So I'm still curious about what actually happened there. To my knowledge, the bricks are still there. This happened somewhere around the mid 2000s when I was in middle school. I was staying at a friend's house for the night in the backwoods of Michigan. Immediately behind my friend Jay's house were a few acres of woods that led to a lake. If you went straight back into the woods from his backyard, there was a path that went straight to the lake, which was intersected at 90 degrees by another path about halfway to it, probably a quarter of a mile from the backyard to the lake. If you went straight down the path from the backyard that turned left at the intersection, the path was a downhill grade followed by a flat portion, followed by an uphill grade, which eventually ran into a two lane country road. One of those 55 mile per hour ones that goes on for miles with not so much, but one or two houses. It was late in the afternoon. The sun was beginning to set. We being middle school boys were running around the woods all afternoon, playing with fake weapons and stuff. Good times. Absolutely nothing leading up to this point was strange. No weird eerie feelings, no odd unidentified sounds, no paranoia or ghost stories prior to playing in the woods. Just two bros running around having a great time. We were basically pretending to be army guys. At one point, Jay decided to run off saying something about flanking the enemy. He dashes off to my left. I started creeping through the woods, pretending to get bad guys as I went. I found myself standing at the intersection described earlier. Straight forward was the lake. To the left was the path that went down, then back up to the road. I was standing looking diagonally between the two paths when I hear some faint sounds slightly off to my right towards the lake. What I saw made my whole body tingle in the worst possible way. About 50 feet, maybe more, maybe less towards the lake and just behind a tree. I see this face and shoulder peeking around it. The most terrifying part was that it was probably two feet or more higher than you'd expect a human's head to be. Before I could probably observe the face which was undoubtedly hairy. It snapped back from behind the tree as it realized I could see it. The color of the figure I saw was light gray, like your average cement sidewalk. Because of that, I was unsure of what it was. My first few thoughts were sheer confusion and fear. Then in my frozen state, I remembered that Jay was wearing a shirt almost exactly that shade of gray. I tried whisper shouting his name, Jay towards the now hidden figure. I called out maybe two or three times, went off about 50 feet behind me and to my left, down the path leading towards the road, Jay emerged from the thicker trees. This was the complete opposite direction from the figure I saw. And there's no way he could have snuck around me in that short time frame. To further drive the point home, it was fall, and the ground was covered in layers of dry, dead, deciduous leaves. The crunch from the leaves was very distinct and could not be avoided. Jay had heard me call out, and from just down the slight decline, he looked up and asked what was going on. I pointed off into the trees where I had seen the figure and said in a normal voice, I saw something big over there. As soon as I finished, that sentence. I mean, the very second, whatever I had seen started stomping off towards the road, parallel to the path we were on, but probably 50 to 100 feet deeper into the woods, woods which were too thick to see anything at that distance. For some godforsaken reason, we tried to run after it, 
Jay and I were athletic, as athletic as 6th or 7th graders could be. We played tons of sports and were quite fast. We were hauling ass down the path parallel to the beast, as fast as we could sprint, and yet it was absolutely smoking us. The road, if I remember correctly, was a solid quarter mile from the intersection of the two paths. We had maybe just finished running down the downhill portion when this monster was already at the road, and believe it or not, we could tell where it was from the crunching leaves, and you could hear its massive footsteps clear as day while running. When we realised it was getting to the road, we also realised a car was coming. I kid you not, as soon as the crunching leaves stopped and the thing stepped out onto the road, the car slammed its brakes and pounded on the horn. Its tyres screeched for a solid three or four seconds at least. When the car finally stopped, we heard the leaves start crunching on the other side of the road, and the car slammed on the gas and peeled out of there like a bat out of hell. Keep in mind, we could only hear all of this. We didn't see the car, so there was no way we could ever track down the person to ask them what they saw. But I wouldn't be surprised if their story is out on the internet somewhere about the time they almost turned Bigfoot into roadkill. We made our way to the road, crossed to the other side, and it was mostly flat woods as far as the eye could see. Nothing but trees, no sight nor sound of the beast. We waited for a bit, and then went back home. A few things to note. Was it Bigfoot for sure? I can't say. But what I do know is that it was tall, hairy, grey, and a hundred percent bipedal. There was absolutely no mistaking the sound of it running. It's funny though, there are descriptions and videos of Bigfoot walking, and moving far faster than a normal human. But I'm almost sure this thing was sprinting. The speed at which it reached the road was utterly unbelievable. It ran a quarter of a mile in probably close to 20 seconds, and trust me, I understand how absurd that sounds. One of the strangest things that ever happened to me was one time when I was first married, around 1987. I took my wife's brother and three nephews camping in a cave. It was located on Highway 17 near Waynesville, Missouri, near the Gasconade River, that's not too far from Fort Leonard Wood. This is a huge cave, and can be seen from the highway. Directly on the other side of the highway was the Ruby Doo River. It ran along the highway and dumps right there into the Gasconade River. The cave has two large openings, the bigger one has a stream running out, the smaller one to the left has a high dry level place, where we can all set up camp big enough for all five of us. I can't remember if it was like the first or second night, but it was around 11 o'clock, and we heard what sounded like a semi-truck crossing the Gasconade River Bridge. And all of a sudden we heard a horrendous crash, like metal bending and trees crashing, and it all grew silent, and we could hear what sounded like pieces of metal still sliding and clinging down the road, and then silence. We all jumped up, and ran down there, and we found absolutely nothing. No wreckage, no broken trees, nothing. That was one of the most baffling things I've ever witnessed. I don't remember seeing any lights, but there were quite a few green trees between us and the highway. I tried to do a search on the net, to see if any wreck matched what all five of us had heard, but I didn't have a clue how to go about it. It must have been some kind of phantom wreck. The Hoya Baku Forest is probably the most famous place in Romania, and certainly the most famous forest in this country. The place became known all around the world since 1968. Even if the locals have known it's a bad place and have been avoiding it for much longer than that. The locals noticed that once they entered the forest, something strange and unusual happened to every single one of them. 
even from the first steps in, you could experience nausea, anxiety, vomiting, severe headaches, and even skin burns. People believe it to be under a very powerful curse, and even a place where the devil wanders free. Drawn by the stories about the forest, Alexander Sift, a biologist, started researching the strange occurrences in the 1950s. He reported feeling constantly accompanied and watched by some presences that he called shadows. These shadows would sometimes take the shape of a couple, who would disappear into thin air as soon as they caught sight of him. He somehow managed to catch the man on camera, right after the woman had vanished. Just as the man was disappearing himself. The photograph depicts the peculiar being with a stub for an arm, with parts of its body becoming translucent, a phenomenon referred to as dematerialization. Sadly, there are not many pieces of evidence, as the better part of the scholar's collection was stolen and destroyed shortly after he passed away. Psychology professor Adrian Patrat had become one of the most notable continuators of Sift's endeavors. His repertoire included images of immaterial shapes, beams of light, spherical objects, none of which can be logically accounted for. However, it is said that whatever events may occur are influenced by the person who enters the forest. So if you are a skeptic, you are likely to get out of there unscathed. August 18th, 1968. The military technician Emile Barnier, 45 years old at the moment, ignored the locals' warnings, then could be found in the forest, trying to spend a weekend away from the stress of the city. He was there with his girlfriend and two other friends. Around 1pm, while looking for firewood, he heard his name being called by his friends. Back in the meadow with his friends, he saw something that looked like a UFO above the forest. Without making any noise, the object started to shine and move in the air. The photos he took were later classified as the clearest images of a UFO taken in Romania, and one of the best taken around the world. Once you get inside the forest, you have the constant feeling that you're being watched, like you're in a place you don't certainly fit in like all the unseen creatures are watching you, like someone who enters their world. Every person who entered the forest reported these weird feelings. The forest is mostly known for the weird apparitions. Intangible structures or materials of various shapes can be seen at night and day. Most of them are impossible to be seen by the human eye, but can be caught on camera. There are also magnetic anomalies, electromagnetic field fluctuations, infrasound emissions, and some other phenomenon are just weird traces that seem to appear on the ground, be it dirt, grass, or snow just under the eye of people. Even the plants were affected, showing signs of dehydrations, burn, necrosis of the stem and leaves in certain areas, and the most typical appearances are those that loom in the sky above it. Suddenly, geometric figures appear in the sky, in flight, in the form of pyramids, spheres, cylinders, cubes, and cones. These geometric shapes have been photographed and filmed hundreds of times. The most peculiar are those in the forms of UFOs and pre-UFOs or quasi-UFOs. The forest is also famous for the fact that within its borders, UFOs invisible to the human eye, but which can be photographed, are more numerous than UFOs visible to the human eye. It's the only place on Earth with this characteristic. People are mostly frightened by the human appearances, such as humanoid heads hidden in the forest. Many tourists freak out when after developing the photos, they realized they weren't all alone, because there were hundreds of hidden faces in the background. Sometimes there have been photos of figures of deceased people. And in 1993, the researcher Adrian Patrat identified in the Basiu Forest a special area which he called Socially Active Point 3. 
The area in question seems to be the centre of maximum activity for paranormal phenomena. Some other interesting facts he claimed to be true are the following. The phenomena in the Huaybaku forest are generally discrete but continuous over time. The forest itself offers more data to researchers than the lovers of spiritualism. The phenomena are clearly obvious, being disputed even by the most sceptical scientists. It seems there is a common connection between the presence in the forest between people with a medium capacity and the appearance of a mysterious phenomenon. The frequency of the paranormal phenomena is fluctuating. The causes of fluctuations haven't been discovered. There are many other places worldwide where there have been reported similar phenomena, but Huaybaku Forest is considered by all great parapsychologists as the most important area of manifestation of parapsychological phenomena on the entire planet. Some people also call this the Bermuda Triangle of Romania. Its name comes from a shepherd that claimed he lost his flock of 200 sheep in the forest. There were also those who tried to open the gate to another dimension within its trees. If you want to visit the forest, my advice is to stick to the said trails and respect the environment. I was fortunate enough to talk to a local once. It seemed to seek him to that day, and he mentioned seeing and feeling things that were beyond his powers of understanding. Around eight years ago, me and some friends used to spend our weekends spelunking and exploring abandoned places at night. We didn't vandalize or anything, we would just go to take cool pictures and spook each other round. There is an old abandoned rock quarry in our county that loads of teenagers go to to throw parties and get drunk. I hadn't ever been down there before, but my friends had been there and they were a few years older than me and had partied down there before. There's a huge hill that you have to park your vehicle at the top of and cross a gate and walk down the hill to reach the quarry. There's a huge pile of rocks in the middle of the land outside of the actual quarry caves, lots of old equipment and broken down bulldozers. We ventured into the quarry cave probably 200 feet in took some pictures and went back outside. There was standing water inside, and we wanted to be as safe as possible. Not knowing how sturdy the ceiling was or how deep the water was. Coming outside, we kept hearing some really strange animal noises. We live in rural Kentucky, so we see bobcats, mountain lions and bears a lot, but usually deep in the woods, which we weren't in at the time. We usually always carried a machete for tearing weeds down and just general safety. We're standing outside of the quarry cave and we're hearing this weird growling, not like a bear or a dog, not like anything we had ever heard before. We had flashlights and we shined them around, looking on the hill surrounding us and found these huge greenish reddish eyes staring at us. We all looked at each other like, what the hell is that? Whatever it was was standing at least nine feet tall, but it was standing like a human, not like a bear would. It was massive. We could see fur and its head was massive. Its eyes were a good foot or two apart, and we kept standing there looking at it, honestly in shock. We started walking fast up the hill, and it was following us along the hill line. We finally made it to the gate, and when we turned around, it was standing around 30 feet away from us. What we saw wasn't a bear. I've seen black bears around my house plenty of times. We still talk about it to this day. I still believe it was a Bigfoot. My friends think it was too. I've looked up information about the descriptions of other people's sightings, and ours sounds very similar to others, especially the eyes. This was just last year. I had moved from New York to Vermont and decided to rent a home for a few months that allowed my cat and dog 
while I waited to close on my new home in Vermont. Last year it was particularly snowy, and this house was located up a small mountain off a dirt road. If 10 cars passed on the road during the day, that was a busy day. I thought it was closer to the village when I first booked it through Zillow. But I wasn't looking to go anywhere really, but to instead heal, rest up and relax from what already had been an exhausting ordeal and moving experience. I had some guy friends who would help me get up there. And they left after one night. I was told not to let my dog run without a leash. As there were a few alpacas at the next door farm who may attack my dog, which was at least one eighth of a mile walking distance away. Not that my aging dog was going anywhere too quickly. He was 17 at the time and could barely walk anymore. He was one of those awesome, really great dogs you may be lucky to have once or twice in your life, got along with everything and anyone. The next door neighbor after that was at least a mile down the road. As I settled into this lovely one story home, the house had automated motion detectors that would light up the driveway that ran behind the house. There stood a huge ancient apple tree that still had some apples on it way high up, even in March, and your usual pine and birch trees surrounding the property. The large front and back lawn areas being several acres in size are surrounded by forests and old rock walls. I grew up in an area in New York where I was surrounded by trees and forests. So I wasn't spooked until the second night. The house had a large pond out front which was covered in ice and snow. There was literally at least four feet of snow on the ground, with just enough of the driveway plowed to get your car in and out. I backed my car by the back door. And there were several outbuildings too on the property. One building in particular was perhaps 30 feet from the back door of the house that you could go through the kitchen to get to. In this open garage like building, it looked to be used like a large garden storage area. There were no doors just an open area. Off the kitchen was a screened in porch that faced the pond out front. So on the second night I take my dog put him on the leash at 8pm and pitch black outside. Fresh fluffy snow of about one foot has fallen. And me being a silly New Yorker with just sneakers without any socks in my nightgown and a light jacket. I walk out the back door with my dog in tow, thinking I'd only be out for a few minutes. I walk him slowly to do his business as I was soon readying to get to bed. As I returned to the door, I soon realized I had inadvertently locked myself out of the house. Oh, no. It was one of those types of doorknobs that you twist in one direction, and it will lock itself. I tried not to panic, but it was cold. And there I am looking silly and thought perhaps well, I could walk to the neighbor's house, but I had no flashlight no cell phone and felt I would break an ankle trying to manage to walk in the dark. That's when I remembered I saw something in the open garage like building. It was a crowbar. I thought I could do one of those MacGyver moves. I've seen enough window break ins on TV and want to take my dog's leash and tie it around my car's left mirror. I knew I would only be losing my deposit at this point. And I'd have to pay for the damage. But heck, I'm stuck outside with no key and freezing temperatures, without any way of even getting into my car to stay in the night with the dog. I go grab the crowbar. And with little hesitancy, and then with full vigor, I took said crowbar facing away, swung it at the glass as hard as I could. It bounced off, making the loudest sound that just echoed in the night, and it even sparked. Now, first of all, what kind of window doesn't break? Mind you, I'm a strong gal. But this was like bulletproof glass on safety glass. Then I thought, well, since perhaps it's a safety feature, let me try another window. I chose another one to the left after surveying it, I could probably get to climb in. And again, same issue. I was like, forget this. There has to be another solution. 
That's when I remembered the screened-in porch that's off the kitchen. And I thought, well, perhaps I could get to the screen porch door that leads outside. And if the door to the kitchen was still unlocked, well, I'd only have to pay for the ripped screen. Much easier than to repair a broken window. So I go and there's at least a 15 inch path of snow that must be cleared for me to even access that screen door. So I go to the garage and grab the shovel I saw earlier. My hands and legs getting colder with every moment and I start to clear the snow shoveling as quickly as I can. At the time, my dog is barking because he can't see me around the corner. His barks echo off the back of the mountain that's beyond the forest in the backyard. I keep yelling at him to quieten down. When I no longer hear him, I don't think about it too much because I have to get inside and figured he'd just calm down. Finally, I reach the screen door and I'm super grateful it's unlocked. I squeeze my way through, pushing more snow out the way and make my way to access the kitchen door, hoping all the while I haven't locked it. And to my relief, it's unlocked. I run through the kitchen, go out the back door to the door from which I got locked out of to grab my dog, not without grabbing my keys this time. I look at the mirror of the car and my dog's not there. His leash just hangs there, and it looks like it's been torn. I start to freak out, like I need any more troubles tonight. I start to walk around the back of the house, and there's my old dog, happily having done his business, just wanting his way back to me. I am one very relieved chick. I tie the leash into a knot so that I can use it the next day. It's one of those retractable leashes made for dogs that are over 100 pounds, and is at least an inch wide. How he tore or chewed through it that quickly, I often wonder. Finally, I get to bed and vow to never leave the house without keys in my hand. The next night is when Bigfoot decides to tell me they're in the neighborhood. I go out again at 8 p.m. It's a clear night and I'm staring up at the stars in disbelief at how pretty it all is. I'm seeing constellations I've never seen after years of living in New York. I'm standing at the back of the house in front of a large picture window that looks out towards the backyard and mountain with an open garage at my three o'clock position to my right. I was only there for a minute or two when I heard the first knock and the two o'clock position and another one coming from the 11 o'clock position from where I'm standing. They were single, very clear knock noises, very much just like the ones I had made the night before while trying to get back into the house by trying to break back into the house through the windows. When I heard the noise, they were very distinctive. I know the sounds that trees make when they sway. This wasn't trees swaying. In fact, it was no wind at all that night. You know, I hightailed it back inside the house in seconds flat and I lock the door. Next night, I'm thinking it's okay. But what would happen next scared me to bits. I'm doing the usual routine of walking the dog just down the driveway. I've now learned where the lights are for the outside, so I make sure they are all on. It's icy and I'm using a ski pole to help me walk safely with a flashlight. The house keys are in my jacket pocket while I walk the dog for his last evening walk. As I start to return to the back kitchen door, I look beyond the open garage out building because a pop of color caught my eye. That's when I saw a pair of really large red eyes looking back at me at the edge of where the yard ends with a rock wall abutting the forest. Perhaps an owl, I think, as I continue to look. I move and shift my body left to right, thinking it must be a reflector something that's catching the lights. I would be good with an explanation, but no, it was eyes. Big red eyes staring straight and watching me. What got me most was how wide apart they are. They were about 100 to 120 feet from where I was standing. They looked at least 10 inches apart. I didn't even want to imagine how big whatever it was that was looking at me could be. I stood there for at least a minute, because I was waiting for it to move until I couldn't comprehend what I was looking at. So I scurried back into the house. The next day I went out 
and looked again at that area from which I saw eyes looking back at me. Looked carefully, even venturing out into the deep snow for about 30 feet, to see if perhaps it was something like reflectors or tin cans. I even retrieved the binoculars, came back out, and I couldn't see anything except for the rock wall, forest, and the sounds of birds chirping happily. As I stayed there for three or four more weeks, I never saw those eyes, or whatever was reflecting again. This is in my first experience with a possible Bigfoot, as I have two others, but these happened in New York. But yes, people, there are odd things up in the mountains in Chester, Vermont, and it wasn't a mountain lion, nor wolf, nor coyote. But to hear that knocking, and then those big red glowing eyes the next day, I kept my night walking the dog very short after that, and I never left the house after dark for any other reason. I can assure you I felt like I was being watched several times after those first few nights. I didn't fear anything, but it was more like they were curious and watching out. The kicker? There was a key hanging right above the shovel I grabbed that first night that would have gained my access back into the house immediately. And yes, I got my entire security deposit back. I adored that house, by the way. And I haven't shared this story much, but my MacGyver days are over, that's for sure. Some friends and I were going to go hiking on the weekend. We'd usually do this and bring some other friends with us, and would try to find new places to go often. Near my town, there's a small inactive volcano which has a cavern system, and for a while now, another friend and I have been trying to map the thing out. While I went up with my mates in September, we got inside the main cave, which is about a mile long, up until a point where you can't go any further without spelunking gear and is God knows how deep. And I was leading the group, as I'd been there the most. Because it was a leisure trip, we were going to have a good time joking, having fun, the usual stuff. In that spirit, I thought it would be funny to put some ambient to the activity, and played some aghast, an atmospheric black metal band that supposedly used summoning rituals in their recordings. To be honest, I've never believed that, to be more than just a gimmick, because you know, 90s black metal, still taking into consideration everything, it may hold some truth. Everything was normal, the music played out from my Bluetooth speaker, and we did the whole tour, and on the way back I was leading the group out, and the last bloke in the line asked us to lend him our torches so he could snap a group picture. We just turned 180 and did so, posing and kept hiking. We got out, we got home, and called it a day. And this is where stuff gets interesting. Normally after a long hike, I tend to sleep really soundly when I arrive home, but that night I kept feeling uneasy, like something bad was gonna happen. I didn't sleep much. The next day, one of my mates posted a picture, and we noticed that indeed something was next to me in one of the pictures. So I guessed that was the reason, that when I got home that night, I swear, I could see the thing for glimpses, with its pale face and pitch black eyes just staring at me, like it was sizing me up for something. When I went to bed, I wanted to crap myself. I could see it standing by the door, getting closer to me. At some point, I just started cursing at it, telling it that if it wanted to go down in my own home, I would put up a damn fight. And surprisingly, that thing looked puzzled at that, like an actor that doesn't know how to follow with another actor ad lib something. I kept at that, and it just left. This thing didn't surrender though, just for a couple of weeks. It started throwing pebbles at my window, and making strange noises. But little by little it just stopped, as if it got bored. In the beginning of last year around March, I was with my best friend and her boyfriend that she had just started dating. Knowing that they had just started, we all wanted to hang out so I could meet him. Our town had many various large neighborhoods and communities, and he lived in a different one than ours, this one being outside of town. 
he takes us on an adventure to this wooded area that we didn't know. I barely met him, but since he was my best friend's boyfriend, I trusted him. He did not know at the time that I am able to sense and occasionally see spirits. I mostly am audio clairvoyant. I think that's what it's called when you can hear them. And as we walk deeper, it's pitch black and we're using the flashlights on our phones and get lost. On our way trying to get back, I feel like we're almost being chased. I'm at the back and her boyfriend is leading. I'm already sensing that we're being followed. I tell them to hurry because I'm in the back and I feel like someone is about to grab me. When someone behind me hissed and punched me to the ground, I screamed so loudly and I'd never screamed when I'm scared. So they booked it, leaving me behind. I catch up to them because I can see their lights and we go to an opening where I can see the back of someone facing away. And you can just tell that it's not human or safe. We try again for a way out, but find this path where at the end I see a white figure waving its hand for us to follow him. I tell them to leave, so we follow the boyfriend and finally made it out. Turns out my best friend saw something push me and heard the hiss. She told me her theory was that this was something that was trying to lure us to something. To me, being pushed down wasn't as scary as some of the other stuff I've experienced but that was the most force that I felt from a spirit to this day. My two friends and I were hiking in a national park. We decided to hike the trail which had much less traffic and arrived early in the morning. My friends and I did smoke a little bit of the green stuff, but we're not high out of our minds. We were talking about peyote and its psychoactive substance, mescaline. When an older man dressed in shorts, hiking boots, a shirt, sun hat, and with a walking stick, overheard us talking about this and decided to get up from the rock he was sitting on to join us on the rest of our hike. We arrived at the entrance of the cave. The older man stayed back while my friend and I explored it. It was very narrow, but opened up to somewhat of a belly room. One way in, one way out. We came back greeted the man, and he told us he wanted to explore it as well. We told him we would wait for him at the entrance. Mind you, this cave wasn't very deep, and we were in there for a total of five minutes. After waiting for him for 15 minutes, we decided to go grab him. When we got into the cave, he was gone. The only thing left was his walking stick sitting in the center of the cave. We called his name and even climbed up into a crevice to see if he had somehow gotten stuck. He wasn't there. Creepiest thing I ever experienced. This all started when I decided to sleep over at my boyfriend's house last night. The night had gone normal. We went to bed early and nothing out of the ordinary seemed to happen. For some reason though, I kept waking up randomly in the night for no reason and my boyfriend didn't seem to sleep much at all. He said he just felt distressed. Anyway, I remember I woke up sometime late in the night. I was instantly filled with a feeling of discomfort, as though something bad was close. Just outside his window, I heard flutes. There were maybe three or four of them, and they were all playing some weird and ominous song. I sat up quickly, and was going to look out the window, but something stopped me. I was just too scared of what I might see. After a few minutes, I managed to look. Right behind my boyfriend's house, there was a small forest by a park. It's fairly dense, but that entire area is just sort of creepy, especially since there was hardly anyone at the park. The fulutes continued for a little while, and I jumped when I felt my boyfriend grab me and pull me down beside him. He hugged me instantly, and the flute stopped right away. He made a few sounds of discomfort, something he usually does when he's scared or distressed. I could only stare through the darkness, trying to figure out what had happened. When I checked the time on my phone, it was around 2.30 in the morning. The next morning, I told my boyfriend, and we spoke about what occurred. I'm a guy who's pretty skeptical about things, 
so I tried to find logical explanations, but couldn't think of anything. I'd never heard that sort of sound before in my life. My boyfriend told me that when he woke up and grabbed me, he felt really distressed, as I had thought, but he said he didn't know why. He said when he saw me looking out the window, his first instinct was to get me away from it and stopped me from looking out it. He said he never heard the flutes and he seemed freaked out when I told him. Now my boyfriend has had quite a few paranormal experiences, but none of them have involved me like this before. He has an indigenous background, so I thought that maybe that had something to do with it. Something similar that especially since he thought he'd seen what might have been a Wendigo sometime in the summer. Does anyone have any idea what this could possibly have been? My family and I were having a trip out to the countryside when my youngest cousin found a little cave, just big enough for a child to enter. He started joking around with us, saying he was going into the cave, even though his mother told him not to. But being a jovial six year old, he went in anyway. And then there was complete silence. Remember, the cave entrance isn't very big. So after my aunt started shouting at him repeatedly to answer and come down and got no response, she began getting worried. She was scared that it was some kind of animal den, and the animal had got him. But being much larger than a six year old, she was in a predicament as she couldn't make her way down successfully into the tunnel. Then there was me, a skinny 15 year old kid who was just small enough to fit through but mature enough to handle a situation. I volunteered myself as tribute and made my way with my mum's phone as a flashlight into this small cave. It was smelly to say the least. And the further I went in, the bigger it got. There at the back of the cave was my cousin. He was passed out. I shined the phone flashlight around in all directions and couldn't see anything amiss. So I gave him a gentle kick in the stomach and asked him if he was okay. He didn't respond. So I flipped him round and he was breathing. Had he fallen asleep? I wasn't entirely sure. I grabbed him and started pulling him out. The hardest part was getting him through the main hole, but he started waking up and crawled his way out by himself. His mother was furious, but the creepiest thing was when she asked what made him go in there in the first place. He said, the little man asked me to come in mummy. He said he wanted some friends. What little man? There was no one in there. I interject. There was, there was the little man. He was about the size of my hand. And by the time I got inside, he told me to go to sleep. And I did. It was well, some of the creepiest stuff I've ever heard. There was no one else in that small cave. No little men. It makes me wonder what the hell he saw. Or if he just imagined it. In the 1800s, as early Americans spread across the continent of North America, they began to encounter not only new and mysterious creatures, but also stories from Native Americans about these same entities. Some of these stories the natives told to the then newcomers dated back centuries, in some cases, possibly even longer. Among these strange and bizarre stories that the natives shared with the early Americans were weird tales of giant men like beasts covered in long hair. Sometimes they lived side by side with people. Other times they lived in caves or forests or mountains, hunting and eating humans like game. Some of the legends spoke of the giant hairy wild men, even eating each other as well. During the middle to late 1800s, stories began surfacing from just about every corner of the country, from the Great Pacific Northwest to the Eastern Woodlands, Great Lakes, and everything in between. Bigfoot has without a doubt been cited all across the United States, newspaper articles, letters from the time period, and 
all point to this reality. However real the phenomena may be, the name Bigfoot didn't accompany these tales in the beginning. The legendary nickname can be traced back to two specific Native American chiefs that lived in the 19th century and had the name of Bigfoot. Likewise, during the late 19th and early 20th century, there were two giant bears spotted roaming the Western American frontier. These massive animals were sighted so many times that the story was picked up by the media, and the bears were dubbed Bigfoot. These bears were apparently quite the sensation to the public at the time, and it stuck in the minds of the people well after the chiefs and bears had come and gone. The term Bigfoot began to apply also to this mysterious creature that we now know as Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Skunk Ape, Yeti, and more, from one side of the world to the other. That said, during the early 1800s, accounts from world-class explorers began to appear in the world news regarding these mysterious creatures with their tall frames, long dark hair, muscular bodies, and incredibly large feet. 1832, British explorer B. H. Hodgson is one of the first respected individuals to go on official records about the subject stated he witnessed one of the creatures in the wilderness of Nepal. At the same time, all across America, reports were flooding in of similar creature sightings. The world-class explorer and Lieutenant Colonel Lawrence Waddell was one of the next to officially spot a Bigfoot, back in 1899. 26 years later, another Bigfoot is located in the Himalayas. 1937 marked one of the first Bigfoot sightings ever reported in the state of Indiana. During the summer in the Cypress Beach area of Boonville, Indiana, a Bigfoot is seen. This sighting is the first of a steady stream of reports from Indiana over the next three quarters of a century. From 1948 to 1953, several explorers sought after Bigfoot. Several of these explorers captured photographs and prints reportedly made by the legendary creature, including Eric Shipton, Peter Bryan, and Sir Edmund Hillary. Mountaineer John Jackson also found and photographed prints of the Bigfoot. In addition to mere footprints, he also discovered primitive paintings which seemed to depict Bigfoot. According to rumors, Five years later, in 1959, Bigfoot feces were collected and tested by interested parties as well. At least one of the parasites found in the stool sample is said to not be identified. The remains of more than likely the same stool were smuggled to London by then famous actor James Stewart. What became of these remains cannot be said. However, there is no question Stewart did indeed smuggle something he claimed to be the remains of a Yeti to London in the year 1959. The following year, Edmund Hillary decides to make another expedition in attempts to track down the elusive creature once more. The expedition is led by Edmund and his team, but yielded nothing. It wouldn't be until several years later, in the late 60s, that the famous Patterson-Gimlin footage would be captured and shared with the public eye. This iconic video clearly shows what appears to be a large and muscular Bigfoot, with long dark hair, standing upright on two legs and moving through a wooded area. Anyone who researches the subject of Bigfoot has definitely seen this particular footage, as it's considered quite the classic at this point. It's been widely debated for many years. This video was credited with kicking off a resurgence in Bigfoot sightings across the country. It could also be argued that the sightings were happening the entire time, and people were just too embarrassed or ashamed to share them. In 1968, the very next year, a Bigfoot was spotted in Spencer County, Indiana. Many more sightings were to happen in the state of Indiana over the years to come. The Bigfoot Field Research Organization, or BFRO has recorded 75 sightings in Indiana since the early 1970s. In addition, the Indiana Bigfoot Field Researcher Organization have also registered 91 unique sightings since the year 1973. I believe it's safe to say, Indiana has had its fair share of sightings. 
During the summer of 2012 on the banks of the Yellow Lake in Morgan County, multiple reports of Bigfoot-like howls reported coming off from the surrounding forest. That very same year in Sterling County, a police officer witnessed what he claimed appeared to be a Bigfoot standing at the edge of his yard. Safe to say, over time, there have been many different accounts from many independent witnesses. But my story? Well. In 2017, I was camping in one of Hoosier State's more extensive protected forests for several days. Typically when I'm backpacking, I'm used to looking for the wildest places with the least amount of people around. I like to enjoy nature, and greedily I love to have the trail to myself for the most part. That said, the area was selected due to its general isolation in comparison to the rest of the park's regular overnight campsites and much larger family-oriented campgrounds. However, it did allow for several other campers and horseback riders to camp in addition to just myself. On this particular trip, I was vamping on the second year in a row. I'd recently switched from using a Chevy Blazer for off-roading in the mountains to a Kia Sedona for cruising around in comfort and was loving it. Vamping was something I'd always wanted to do, so I was doing it. The minivan was converted into a stealth camper with GPS, Wi-Fi, and all the supplies I needed for a few days at a time. The back seats were removed, a bed was installed, and I had plenty of storage for my gear. When I found a place I liked, I'd stop and go for a hike. If I liked the area, I'd hang out for a few days, and if I didn't, I'd head on down the road. It was in this manner that I found the area where I encountered the Bigfoot. I had tried out a couple of different camping sites in the forest that I found pretty ideal at first, but then somewhat lacking after just a bit of exploring. And these spots were too close to people for my liking. Just before this event happened, one of my younger brothers had accompanied me on a trip to the same region. Our trip had been a couple of days prior and about 50 miles further south than the journey I am describing now. I mentioned this fact because it was on the earlier expedition with my brother Colt that I was studying maps of the area. I'd found a few places on the map that looked promising. Plenty of forest, several trails, and only a few residences, within a 45 minute drive from the nearest town. My kind of hiking and camping, more or less uninterrupted. After dropping Colt off in Louisville, Kentucky, I headed back across the Ohio River to Indiana and straight into the heart of the Hoosier National Forest. Once I got there, I plugged a few campsites into my GPS cruised around for what turned out to be four hours, checking out two or three potential sites, and eventually I settled for one, knowing it would be dark soon, and wanting to get out for a walk. That's just what I did. The first couple of days were quiet. There was absolutely no one around, and I took the time to get to know the trails. There were two main trails to choose from, each one of them as isolated as the next in regards to the majority of the park's major trail system. Also, it's worth mentioning that it was getting late in the season. Summer was turning into autumn, and the trails in the area were mainly for horses to begin. So when I say no one was there, I mean no one. I particularly enjoyed this aspect. From my camp, one of the trails headed north and slightly west, the other trail was a loop, leading into one of the deeper parts of this particular national forest. Furthermore, this loop is extremely excluded and has no other paths that cross it, period. I spent the better part of the first two days exploring these first, and it was quite enjoyable. It connected to the campground several hundred yards away from the looping horse trail. As I said, this loop doesn't interact with any other of the park's other trails, including this one. However, their trail heads are located within eyesight of each other if you're standing in the right place. I hiked down the first trail for what felt like several miles at the very least. I'm not exactly sure how far it was because honestly, I had no reason to be documenting anything. I was just enjoying myself and the beauty of the forest. 
The trail ran through a heavily forested area with the path. It had slight ups and downs to the terrain, meaning it wasn't flat, but definitely not mountainous either. Hilly would be the perfect word for it. Anyhow, when Friday rolled around, the weather was really lovely, and several people showed up with trucks and trailers to go horseback riding. That's when I moved to the most remote corner of the campground, because I don't like crowds. Besides, I'd already explored the other trails over the previous few days, so I let the horseback riders have the trails for the weekend. At some point that same afternoon, I ran to the nearest town with my camper van to pick up some supplies for the weekend. It was then while I was driving down that little windy country road that led to the nearest Keydink store within a 45 minute drive from the camp that I saw it. I will never forget that moment. I was multitasking, and that seems to help me remember things better. I had come around the corner and I was watching the road and talking to my wife over the phone. I was checking my mirrors, the rear view and the left driver's side when I noticed something moving on the hillside that I was driving by. It had been a few days since I saw any animals, so I was eager to see what it was. The hill was open wide for probably about 50 to 100 yards until reaching the trees. Standing just outside of the trees was what I can only describe as a Sasquatch. It was approximately 50 yards from me, and it was extremely tall and muscular, and covered in long dark hair. It was huge, just like the stories I'd heard, but not bulky like a gorilla, more like an extremely tall and well built man. I would guess the thing weighed no less than 300 pounds of solid muscle. I did a double take over my shoulder as I drove by, and the image was burnt into my memory forever. I remember my brain trying to rationalize that it couldn't be real. That said, I mentioned to my wife that someone had placed a hell of a lifelike statue on that side of the hill, a hill in the middle of nowhere. As I'm telling her this, I realized just how ridiculous that sounds. At the time, my brain was still trying to make myself believe that it was some sort of statue and not a real Bigfoot. But at the same time, I was also recalling how its hair was blowing in the wind and how its incredible muscles were bulging like that of a bodybuilder. I was in total shock. Spending as much time in nature as I do, it wouldn't take much to start to believe these legends are nothing more than stories. I mean, I've spent days, as much as weeks at a time in the wild. Sure, I've seen some crazy things, but regardless of that fact, seeing a Bigfoot was not something you're expecting to see or can possibly prepare yourself for. I continued onto the store, collected my supplies without wrecking my van, and when I made it back to camp a few hours later, I tried to forget about the event again and carry on with my day. However, it wasn't able to escape my mind so quickly. I decided to go exploring instead to try and wrap my head around what actually happened. Starting with the loop trail that I had yet to entirely hike, I walked down the path for about 45 minutes. I followed the trail until I found a dry creek bed that I gladly decided to pursue. You see, I enjoy hiking along dry creek beds, as I'm fully aware these were the old trails and highways, so to speak, of the ancient people. They didn't use paved roads like we do, so they followed rivers, streams, and game trails. Over the years, I found arrowheads, primitive tools, and all kinds of artifacts in this manner. Anyhow, I was walking down the creek for roughly two miles or so. I was actively looking for patches of fur and any sign of a trail. Anything that may indicate something as big or even larger than a human traveling through the area. I did find a few curious trails, but they soon disappeared due to the rocky surface. Other than a few rocks that could have been primitive tools, I didn't see anything else that interested me besides the few ghost trails I'd found. Eventually, I lost interest. Feeling defeated, I turned back and made the hour's hike back to the creek bed, down to the trail, and back towards camp. When I finally got back to the beginning of the trailhead and started crossing the campground towards my van, I noticed a buck step out of the woods in the opposite side of the forest. 
was the first living creature I had seen aside from on the drive. The deer stepped onto the gravel road that circled around the campground and stared directly at me. I looked back at it, and we both just stood there staring at each other. After what seemed like a few minutes, but was probably nothing more than mere seconds, the deer turned its head back towards the woods that it had just come from, and walked off, vanishing into the trees. I continued on my back to my campsite, feeling strangely odd about the encounter. The next day I didn't really feel much like hiking, so I piddled around camp for a bit, for a change. I had a campfire, carved a bit, sipped some strong coffee and had a meal, and decided to take a rest at some point, partially due to boredom, and also partially due to feeling strangely let down from the day before. So I climbed inside the van to stretch it out. I was laying there for a moment, thinking about how many nuts must have fallen out of this tree and hit the van since I'd been there this weekend, when I realized that they weren't falling out of the tree at all. Rather, they were actually hitting the side of the van, and that something or someone must be throwing them. Shivers ran up and down my spine as I remembered what I had seen earlier that day on the hillside as I was driving to town for supplies. I sat up immediately, no longer feeling secure in the safety of my van. I was parked less than 50 feet away from the edge of the forest, and about the same from my fire pit. There was a rather large tree, some sort of oak standing between the van and the fire pit. When I got out the van and stood up straight, a walnut or crab apple came flying out of the woods and smashed into the tree. It hit the tree trunk hard, that the thing bounced a good 25 feet off the tree's trunk and then rolled another 50 before coming to a full stop. I remember my first thought about the flying object impacting the tree was the speed and accuracy and power behind it. My second thought was that my face would have been just as easy for whatever it was to throw it to hit. Immediately I look all around me, but of course there was no one there. I also realized that at the time while I was napping, the very last person camping other than myself had left the campground. I was the only human around here for miles. I was the only person actually camping the entire weekend to begin with. Everyone else who came into the area during the time of the story simply drove into the area, made their way around the loop and left. Alternatively, they came with a truck and trailer and went horseback riding. But now I was the only one here. The one person that significantly stood out among the rest of the crowd over the weekend was a man driving a golden van, much like mine, with blacked out tinted windows. He was playing loud classic rock and wearing dark sunglasses. This was the individual who had disappeared while I was napping. He was the last person to leave the campground that weekend other than me, and was the only other person who hadn't been horseback riding. He hadn't been hiking either. I don't actually know what he'd been doing other than parking directly across from me and listening to loud music since shortly after my Bigfoot sighting. When I stepped out the van, and that thing smashed into the tree, I quickly realized that I was alone with this thing. I also rationalized rather swiftly that this thing had waited for the right moment to get my attention. As crazy as it seemed, or more appropriately, they had waited until every last truck trailer horse had left before tossing rocks at my van windows. Now I've never claimed to be the brightest crayon in the box, that's for sure, but this didn't take a genius to figure out, or maybe it did. I'm mentally challenged, which is why I thought the correct thing to do would be to run straight into the woods, the same direction the rocks and walnuts had come from, and search for who or what had thrown them. I've never shielded away from unusual experiences, quite the opposite. I saw this as a unique opportunity, I wanted to get to the bottom of what the hell was going on around there. Was it all somehow an elaborate hoax? I don't know, but I'm sure planning on finding out. I charged into the nearest section of foods to my camp, like a moron carrying a five foot staff as it would do anything to a Bigfoot. Thankfully for me, but to my utter dismay, there was nothing to be seen in the forest's edge. 
I stood there listening and waiting, but never heard a peep from anything but creaking trees. In hindsight, and in 100% honesty, it never occurred to me what I might have seen if I'd have just looked up into the treetops. But it wasn't meant to be because the thought didn't cross my mind. Instead, I swung my head from side to side, scanning every tree trunk, branch and rock and log in sight for the nearest bit of movement. Heart beating, with nothing showing, I walked around the edge of the woods a bit more and then headed back to camp, bewildered. No one else showed up to the campground that night, and I never heard anything else that night either. However, what happened the very next morning is actually the most interesting part of the story. On my last morning at the Hoosier National Forest, I was sitting on my campfire, sipping on some hot coffee, trying to wake up. I always carry an old fashioned percolator to make campfire coffee. I had been awake for about half hour. When I begin to hear a car engine, I think about several miles away. The sun was just starting to come up, meaning it was around 6 to 7 a.m. I stood up from my fire and was stretching out when I noticed the sound of the car continuing to get closer. At this point, it must have been hardly a mile or two from camp. This is when things got weird. As I mentioned before, I was parked very close to the wood line. The main trail that I'd been hiking on was no less from 20 feet away from where I laid my head in the van to sleep, which is something I usually never do. Sleep so close to a public trail, as you never know who or what might come down the trail to catch you napping. Believe me, I've heard horror stories about people disappearing from nature parks. The amount of missing people in the United States is in the tens of thousands at any given time. Many of these cases involve national and state parks, but that is for another time. The reason I take the time to explain this is because of what happened next. If I hadn't been standing on the edge of the woods practically inside it, I doubt I'd have been able to hear what I did. Fate would have it that what happened next, I not only heard, but I heard it so vividly it haunts me to this day. The car came nearer to our location, and two distinct noises began almost simultaneously. Within a split second, a third noise added to this strange symphony of sounds, not so softly blowing my unbelieving mind. The first sound was not so strange as it was frightening. A half yell, half scream. It sounded like every person who's ever claimed to have heard a Bigfoot say what it sounded like. Something between man and animal, something not human, but not creature either. Something more. Whatever it was, didn't sound happy. I was entirely beside myself, as if I were dreaming for a moment due to the bizarre nature of the entire trip, but I soon snapped back to myself. Several large branches began to break from several directions out in the forest, barely beyond my parked van. When I say large branches, I mean massive, because I could hear them snapping from great distances as they steadily moved further into the depths of the forest. Some of these noises were much nearer than others, but many of them sounded like they were on the other side of the most adjacent hill surrounding camp. As I stood there, the sound of the branches breaking ascended the nearest hill and then promptly descended on the opposite side, obviously going in the same direction. The exact direction of the screams or calls. My mind was blown again. Had this thing just summoned the others within those three horrifying shouts? It sure looked like it. If I had to guess, each branch that was broke was located somewhere from the middle to the top of the trees. None of them were low branches. And we're not talking about small trees here. This incident was in a national forest, which is federally protected and has some rather old trees specifically in this part. They have larger roots and have lots of thick upper branches. I would also guess that the distance between each sound of breaking branches was probably 10 to 20 yards, but it's impossible for me to gauge. However, I've spent years in the wilderness, and anyone who knows me will tell you that my judgment of time and distance is usually quite on the mark. No doubt whatever it was, 
It must have been rather large, strong and agile, not to mention several of them out there. And not only that, I realized with dread, but apparently a number of things had been out there in the woods extremely close to my campsite, surrounding it on two sides. I was completely unaware until the car came down the road. Had they been there the entire night? Had they followed back from the day before when I'd spent a few hours searching the forest for signs of them? I was chilled to the bone. I listened to the receding tree branches snapping with the force of whatever was swinging, jumping or otherwise moving from tree to tree. Whatever they were, they were moving extremely quickly. It couldn't have taken them more than a few seconds to cover an entire hill that would have taken a man several minutes to walk up. I mean, literally 10 to 15 seconds tops. And whatever was moving out there through the trees was gone from the edge of my campsite and entirely out of my hearing range. I'm aware these events may not seem alarming. However, if you were there, you'd without a doubt understand exactly how unnerving a situation like this can be. Likewise, if you've ever encountered something similar, you can imagine how terrifying yet intriguing these sort of things can be. I purposefully neglected to mention one of the most critical aspects of that morning's happening. And in fact, to be perfectly honest, the branches of the trees breaking was, in my opinion, a direct response to what I'm about to explain. That morning as I had stood stretching with coffee cup in hand, when I heard the car coming, the insanely creepy three howling screams and the breaking branches, I'd listened to an additional sound as well. A drum. You heard that right. As clear as day what sounded, by all means, to be a large drum beating in the distance. It rang out several times, spaced smoothly in an even rhythm. The drum beat in the distance, yet it was close enough that I could plainly hear it low and powerful. If you've ever had the pleasure of attending a Native American powwow, or visiting an authentic drumming circle, you would know that it's hard to mistake a tribal sounding drum beat. And that's precisely what I'd heard. The moment the car was within a quarter of a mile from the campground, the drum abruptly stopped. The branch breaking had ended as well. As bizarre of a situation as it was, and genuinely surreal in any event, what was happening somehow made perfect sense to me. These things that had been lurking at the edges of my camp for whatever reason, sounded an alarm at the oncoming vehicle, to which they all retreated together. All of those branches breaking, moving away in the same direction of the drum and the three howls. There was more than one of them. I'd say at least three, but more likely closer to four or five. What I can say for sure is that they were moving incredibly fast and sounded large. I don't know of any other animal in this part of the country that's capable of breaking branches like that. Even more, covering the amount of distance in such a short amount of time. And don't get me started on the drum, because I would honestly really love nothing more than to know what the hell it was all about. I know what I saw during the trip to the Hoosier National Forest, and I know what I experienced. That's all there is to it. If I were a Bigfoot, Sasquatch, or some other type of being besides a human living in the world, I would probably want my privacy too. I mean, come on, it's not like us humans have such a good track record of sharing or being great friends to the environment, let alone each other. I'll be the first to admit I have no idea what Bigfoot is. Popular theories propose that Bigfoot could be a Lanian race, a relative of the Neanderthal, or even creatures that walk between dimensions. I don't know what they are, but I know that they are real. A family member of mine got caught in a silo. He fell in, and it was like quicksand and nearly drowned. He was buried up to his neck before it was shut down, and the sinker stopped. Occasionally, the grain on the surface of the pile would crust over, because moisture makes grains sticky, and form a hard top. This top is generally hard enough to walk on. The nature of the work was that the workers would enter the silo, 
using rods and push the grains down and allow it to fall, stir, mix and sink correctly. Basically unstick it by pushing it. So that's what my family member was doing when he got stuck. He pushed some down and brought down a larger portion that must have had an air pocket below him. And the area he was standing on fell away. His feet were buried. And to lift them you'd need to overcome the weight of the grain, packing in and filling all available space. Not safe since the workers weren't tied off. Other persons in the silo were distracted working on another spot. Two way radios don't work inside of them because they're silos. And also while pushing the grain down the auger is running. Another hazard here is that at the bottom of them, they have augers which are metal corkscrews that rotate to pull and push the grain, usually on a conveyor belt to distribute them to the other silos or chutes. My family member said that if he'd have sunk another two feet, he'd have lost a foot in the auger, and then more as he sank, and then more again. Resolution is that after sinking up to his waist, he finally got his partner's attention who ran outside to the control booth to shut off the auger. Then the fire department came and the EMTs. They worked for about eight hours to unbury him. Directly lifting didn't work as the grains were too tightly packed together. It was a bit like trying to pull you out of concrete. They tried vacuuming the grains out of the way and more spilled in to replicate what was removed. The only way to evacuate him of the grains was to reactivate the auger, which was a bad idea. They eventually sunk plywood into the grain around my family member, making a makeshift dam walling off the grain. They could then vacuum enough out to continue lifting without the grain replenishing. He spent four days in the hospital from mild crushing and pressure related trauma, but generally did okay. There was also some muscle damage from failed attempts to pull him out, torn tendons and stuff. As you can imagine, that was a nerve wracking day. This story takes place in Poland. I have one friend who has always been an atheist and I was a Christian. But things were changing as time grew up. And I sort of lost my religion too. My story happened a year ago. I became kind of an atheist and later started to read about Slavic mythology, as I was always interested in history. Sometime later I became pagan. And my friend who I mentioned has become pagan also. A year ago, we decided to build an altar for our gods. We found a nice place with a fallen tree in the middle of a forest, as forests are sacred places in the religion of our ancestors. And we had chosen a place with a big fallen tree because a fallen tree struck by lightning is also scared due to believing that it was hit by Perun, which is the Slavic God of Thunder. So we started building the place and our first altar was devoted to Veles, the god of the underground, the forests of magic. The second altar was built for Savok, god of the sky, sun and fire. The things have started to become paranormal when we decided to build an altar for Perun. Our two previous altars were simple, just wooden beams with symbols inserted to the ground. For Perun's altar, we decided to carve a face in the beam. So I got a knife and hammer and started carving a face. And this was where I first encountered something otherworldly. As I was carving the face, I wanted to see what my friends were doing as there were three of us in total, because we took one of our friends with us to build the place. When I was turning around to see what they were doing, I noticed something downhill as our place was built in a small hill, passing from tree to tree. When it got behind the second tree, it was gone. This something was human shaped and didn't have a face. And it was wearing a white dress covering all its body. A few days after, we were at the place and we wanted to make a campfire to cook some food and get some nice vibes. It was complete darkness in the forest. And at this time of year in Poland, it gets dark around 4pm. So we were in the middle of the forest surrounded by darkness. 
and we only had our smartphones, flashlights, and we couldn't light the fire because it was winter and everything was wet. As we couldn't see anything, we only could see about a meter or two in front of us. But thanks to our flashlights, we decided to collect bark from the tree because it should have been dry and we should be able to light the fire with it. As we were doing this, we started to hear footsteps down the hill where I saw a ghost. This is where I got scared and we stood as close to each other as we could, took out our lives and were just standing there with foam flashlights and our weapons ready. And we were listening to the footsteps. It was something like three to four footsteps and a pause for a moment and then three to four more footsteps, like something was going around us, not getting close to our lights and we were freaking out and decided to run in the opposite direction to where we heard the footsteps. We were running through the forest until we encountered a road. Then we just started to walk and we got out from the forest. At this moment, I wanted to say why the footsteps couldn't be a human or animal. So as I mentioned, it was complete darkness in the forest and you couldn't see anything without a flashlight. So it couldn't be human because he would not see anything in the forest. So how would he know to get close to us without using a flashlight? We started to run out the forest. We were scared, but me and my friends decided to go back there to check what it was. I think we felt the adrenaline rush and that's why we chose to return. We also asked our third friend if he wanted to come with us, but he chose to stay. When we finally arrived, we noticed that nothing had changed and everything was fine. And so we returned. When we were getting out of the forest, my friend suddenly got scared and I asked him if everything was all right. And he said he'd just seen a ghost at the crossroads. I asked him what the ghost looked like and he described the same one I'd seen while carving faces. When we got out the forest, we were walking on a normal road and the forest was behind us. We turned our head and behind us, we saw two figures coming out the forest following us. At first, we just thought they were some people. We were constantly turning our heads behind us to see if they were still following us. They were still there, but at some point when we turned, they were gone and they turned in the other direction because we were walking through a straight road without any turns. And then we realized those two figures were weird because we didn't see them earlier when we were at the forest. They just appeared out of nowhere when we left and they looked the same. They had the same height, same male shape and no face or anything. Me and my friend think that they could be sort of guardians of the forest. I know that my two friends later saw the white woman ghost again at the same time when she was wandering through the railroad within the forest. This was everything that we encountered in that place. We went back after but didn't see the white woman or any other ghost. I then realized that the paranormal activity ended with winter. It was very strange. We still go back to the forest sometimes, but we haven't returned to our altar in a very long time. I really do wonder what this could be about. A few years ago, a friend and I went to explore a nearby limestone cave. I had been there before, but never gone very deep. I have read of a waterfall which eventually leads to an expansive area beyond. So we set out to try and find the path. Since we'd never been on this route, we took turns going forward and checking back to avoid passing points of no return without one of us being above with a rope to toss down. After the familiar route was behind us, we found a tight climb down. The squeeze was like going from the front seat to the back seat in a compact sedan that's vertical. No problem. Next, we find a tunnel, wide but short. We took our packs and dragged them behind our feet while we crawled maybe 15 to 20 meters. It was getting a little claustrophobic, but we knew what we were getting into. We came to a small opening about the size of half a bathroom. This space we could stand in and so was a bit of a relief. The path forward was a small square tunnel 
the same height as the previous route, but maybe two meters wide. We jokingly called it the coffin crawl. This route required us to go one behind the other, and led to a 90 degree turn. At the turn I could see this path continued on past the range of my headlamp, but mostly all seemed level and safe. At this point, slowly, it became apparent the path was getting more narrow ever so slightly. If we wanted to turn back, we would have had to have crawled backwards in single file. I could not speculate how far we had crawled, but it seemed like a very long way, until I could make out a small opening ahead, maybe the size of a cramped coat closet, but two thirds of the height. At this point, that space was looking pretty comfortable, because it would mean we could at least turn around if we decided to return. Right before coming to the closet sized space was the tightest squeeze I've ever tried in a cave. I had to place one arm ahead and drag one out to get my shoulder to fit diagonally. As my light illuminated the closet space, I could see a single stalagmite in the center, and some bats resting on its walls and sloped ceilings. Small mouse-eared bats were infrequent but not a shocking sight, until our voices disturbed them and they decided to exit, past our prone, one by one bodies. Their fluttering should have been non-threatening, but with the inability to get out it became very unsettling. It took a lot of mental control to avoid panicking from the lack of space, apparent lack of air, and astro heebie jeebies. After the bats had passed and I caught my breath and sanity, we entered the small opening. Upon the single stalagmite was a small note, the torn corner of a piece of notepaper. The note in blue pen read, nothing here. We had not found the path we sought, and instead found nothing. This happened this past summer, the summer of 2019. I have been paranormal hunting for about 15 out of my almost 30 years of life. So I have had plenty of experiences with all different types of entities. This is just one of my several memorable experiences. This was on a road near where I live. This road is completely forested, save for the bar at one end of the hiking trail on the occasion. Towards the middle of the road, there is a path that leads to a tree that looks like it is bleeding and is known as the bleeding tree or the hanging tree, because in the past, that was a tree that was used for lynchings. Further down the road, there is another path that is roped off that leads to an old shed that burnt down in the 90s. I had been going to the road for a few months at that point, and had a lot happen, including but not limited to touching voices through the spirit box, EVPs, black eyed children, and even being chased by what could only be assumed to be a hellhound. This place has had a really dark past, KKK meetings and lynchings black magic rituals, and satanic rituals, so this place is a hot spot when it comes to the paranormal. Apparently, there were some members that were arrested for lynching people, and they claimed to have lynched at least 10. The locals who live near the road have so many stories and even fear the road, saying it's a portal to hell itself, and no good comes from the road. My group and I usually go every Sunday night. This night started out like any other night on the road, the usual creepy feeling of being watched, shadows darting in between the trees, the sound of branches breaking like a person was walking in the forest. My group consisted of seven people. There was me, my girlfriend, Josh, Heather, Sam, and Sam's younger brother, Samuel. We got to a bit of a quiet way down the road when my girlfriend and Sam decided they wanted to turn back. Sam was already having a really bad feeling being an empath, and my girlfriend's ankle was killing her due to a previous injury. Josh, Samuel, 
Heather and I, continue while they went back to the vehicles. We stopped at the entrance to the path to the hanging tree to do a spirit box session, and caught the voice of a woman we had repeatedly caught before, that is known as Juanita. We then saw a shadow, dart between the path, which scared Heather, so we decided to keep moving forward down the road. We ended up stopping towards the end of the road to take a break, and to see if we could find anything at that specific area. That area is known to have an apparition appear that is wearing white robes, which the locals assume is a member of the KKK. After about five minutes of seeing nothing, we decided to start another spirit box session, where we tried to communicate directly with this entity. We ended up getting the same male voice several times, but we weren't able to understand what it was saying. At this point, I started to get annoyed, but I did something very stupid, which I tell my investigators never to do. I began to antagonize the entity telling it that it was evil for what it did, and that it had no right to take any lives, and that the entity was un-American and a coward. After calling it un-American, and while I said the word coward, we got a deep, growly voice through the spirit box, screaming that he was going to kill us. The rest of the group heard this, and I stopped speaking and started to get excited, because it was the first clear voice we had gotten since Kwamita all night. The moment I started to talk to the rest of the group, I felt two hands wrap around my neck and grip me tightly. The grip got tighter every time I tried to speak or grasp for air. It got so tight at one point that I could feel it start to collapse my trachea. Almost as fast as it started, it disappeared, and I was left on the ground gasping for air. I suddenly felt like I got kicked in the side, which caused me to vomit. After that, we decided that the night was finished and called Sam to come pick us up. When we got back to the cars, I had my girlfriend and the rest of the group check me, and I had bruise marks all over my neck as if someone had been strangling me. After that, we just said our goodbyes and went home. This is one of the many tales I have of this road. This experience happened about a week after the last one. Myself and two other people from the previous group, Josh and Samuel, went to another location in a nearby city that the city locals call Hell. The place used to be an old paper mill until it burnt down back in the 80s and 75 people lost their lives. Since then, it has become the local teen hangout, and every single one we have interviewed has had an experience there. The teens have done pretty much everything from using Ouija boards to holding satanic rituals in the building. We only spent an hour in the building because of how dangerous it appeared to be, what with it being burnt down and all, and the entire time we were there, we felt as if something wanted us to get out, and got aggressive if we stayed too long. We really didn't want anything aggressive towards us while we were in this decrepit building, because if we were pushed, we could have easily fallen through the various holes in the floor, the smallest of which is what I estimate to be a 100 foot drop. We go there the next day, which is Monday, me and a few friends of mine and my girlfriend were hanging out playing video games when my friend Thomas gave me a call. He told me he went to the road, the one we'd just been to, and he and his friends were being attacked by something. I drove over there with my girlfriend immediately and found them all in a church parking lot, not too far away from the road itself. Thomas was the only one who was coherent. Two were writhing on the ground, Haley and JJ. Mum was unconscious, Abby. And there was a fourth friend there, Richard. He was freaking out too, and making no sense. JJ was screaming, saying he was being scratched, which I checked, and he had indeed several scratch marks along his torso. Haley was saying something was hitting her, 
and after we were able to calm everyone down and wake up Abby, we all went back to the road. Haley was saying there was a little girl with her, holding her hand, telling her that she had to kill JJ, Abby's brand new boyfriend. JJ kept on seeing a large shadow figure circling the group. Quick side note, Abby is the person who can see ghosts who apparently has been following her since she was born. Abby said that the little girl with Haley was actually a demon. This put me on the offensive, in which I immediately started to do a minor exorcism. Just to note, I'm not a priest, nor am I someone who's actually trained to do exorcisms, but I still tried to help regardless. While I was performing this, Haley seemed to be quite confused, as if not knowing what was going on. JJ, who had been quiet the entire time and not wanting to help, started to laugh and mock us, but not in his usual voice. It was deeper. It almost sounded like there were two people speaking at once. It was at this point that we realized that it was actually JJ who was possessed, not Haley. We ended up calling Haley's dad, who was a priest and asked him to come help us, and he immediately did. While we waited about 10 minutes for her father to arrive, we had to constantly fight JJ to keep him from running into the forest, and he ended up flailing and kicking my girlfriend pretty hard and punched Thomas in the face, spat in mine and headbutted me. And when the priest got there, he immediately started to perform an exorcism, while Thomas, Richard, Nabby, and my girlfriend held him down. He was screaming obscenities and flailing around, ended up hitting me on the chest a few times during it. And when everything was finished, we got back into the vehicles and left. While resting, I ended up talking to JJ and finding out he had went to hell, the same hell from the forest, literally just hours before I had gotten there the previous day. I gave him some advice to go to church often to keep himself safe and to make sure he was safe and that everything was gone. I gave him my number in case anything else happens and told him he needed to stay away from places like hell and this road due to his private past. After that, we all went our separate ways. I kept up with JJ for a few weeks and he seemed to be doing fine, but then I lost contact with him. I hope he's still okay and followed my advice. This happened to my mum. Back in her youth, she and her sister would go exploring the local fields. There was an old quarry that had long since been abandoned, and it obviously left a huge gap in the ground, where there was also a cave system. Her and her sister were always told never to go into the quarry, and especially to never set foot in the cave. They, of course, being young and silly girls, didn't listen. So my mum and auntie went in there one day with their friends to try and explore and see if they could find anything of interest. The quarry was chalk, I believe, so I'm not really sure what they were going to find. Point being, they went in, four of them in total. The youngest of their friends, Alyssa, was talking about how scary it was when she slipped and fell into the dark. There was a loud resonating splash and they looked down and with just enough visible light saw her gasping for her life. She couldn't swim. She was screaming and flopping around in the water. So my mom who could swim, whether it was bravery or stupidity, jumped in after her. It was quite the drop, she says. She told me that when she hit the ice cold water, it felt like her whole body was freezing up and she found it hard to breathe. But the sheer determination to save her friend kept her going. She pulled her to the side where the edge was and there was just enough room for them to hold on to. They called for help and my grandfather came out with a rope and a bunch of the other men and managed to get them out. Both of them got hypothermia as that water was truly freezing, but fortunately they both survived. After that, they got the local government to close the entry and put a huge metal seal on it so that no one could enter. Turns out, they weren't the first people to go exploring, and in the past, other kids had gone in, 
and actually passed away, meeting their end in the icy cold abyss, something that my mother's friend very nearly suffered. Where I grew up, there were a few storm drains that all went to the same pond. My friend Amanda and I were messing around in the woods near one of the openings, and we could hear this really sharp echoing cry that made us both nervous. We thought it was the wind at first, and then Amanda threw a rock into the opening, and it stopped for a minute. So at this point, we figured it must be something alive. We climbed back out of the woods, and went to the next pipe and could hear it there too. Now, I'm scared, and Amanda is trying to prove how she isn't afraid of anything. So we go to the next one. This one is quieter. So we go back in the other direction. Now I'm being a baby because it's raining a little, and I'm not supposed to get my clothes wet. I was nine at the time, so I'm begging Amanda to go home. As she stops to assure me we are safe, we hear this horrible deep wailing noise and start to panic. I can feel my pulse in my neck, and I'm sweating, and Amanda puts her face into the opening of the drain. The noise happens again, and Amanda takes off down the hill and into the pipe opening. I'm now crying because Amanda abandoned me in the rain, and there's a monster in the pipes. Amanda starts yelling my name, and I have to put my face into the opening to hear her. So now I'm really crying, and she tells me to call the fire department. So I run to the nearest neighbor and tell them to. I explain I don't know why we need to call, but Amanda is in the pipe outside their house. They get all snooty, because Amanda is the heaviest kid in the neighborhood, so they assume she got stuck. They call the non-emergency number and a truck comes to remove the cover. Turns out Amanda recognized the sound of an angry cat and ran into the pipe. It was a mama cat and her kittens were stuck beneath the wire grate inside the drain. So the rain was drowning them and they were crying. Thanks to Amanda, they got all but one kitten out and the mama cat in time before the rain got worse. She got to keep one of the kittens and no one believed us even though we were both there and the firemen. No one believed she could fit into the pipe. <laughs>